Where will you be in three years? Where's your school going to be in three years? You're going to be somewhere, but are you going to be there on purpose? That is the key, my visionary leading friend. That's what we're here to do on the PBL Simplified Podcast. We've got a conference coming up in June where we can guide your whole team through defining the next three years and what project-based learning could look like, how you implement well, how you create a grassroots movement, which sounds like an oxymoron, but it's not. You can bring an initiative to your school and have it be a grassroots movement because you get your teachers empowered and fired up to lead. And we've done it in multiple districts, and we will show you how to do it. We actually guide you, leader, and your leadership team through the process so you create culture and momentum together. We can do it through design days. We can come directly to you and customize it however you want to do it. I just want you to know that it's possible. Your vision sounds crazy in some circles. Some people don't think it's possible, but it is. There are thriving ecosystems of project-based learning happening around the country, and we can help you be one of those. Are your teachers fighting apathy in their classrooms? Are you having trouble finding your passion for the work? Or are you fired up and you're not sure how to get to the next level? If you answered yes to any of those questions, you are in the right place. My name is Ryan Stoyer, and this is the PBL Simplified Podcast, dedicated to equipping you to be a visionary leader who's committed to self-development, collaboration, and changing education. While a managing leader may be working to get through the day or the year with as little as conflict as possible, you're a visionary leader. You know that things need to change. You can't let people's feelings get in the way. You can't let myths or misconceptions or sacred cows get in the way. You've got work to do. So how do we equip you as the leader? Because if we equip you well, your school will go well. And then how do we get your staff on board so it's not just you pushing the boulder uphill, but you've got momentum with your staff and they're rowing with you. You were made for a time such as this, and I'm here to guide you down the path to fulfill your vision. Welcome, visionary leader. Oh, I'm fired up for today's podcast episode. We've got a leadership episode today. Today, we're going to be looking at a need to know, how do elective courses like PE fit into PBL? The Leadership Leap, we're going to look into Mindset by Carolyn Dweck. Undoubtedly, you've heard of her work around growth mindset, but have you read the book? Maybe you don't need to. Maybe I'll give you enough insights that you can speak to it intelligently, or maybe I'll give you some insights and you want to pick it up. Either way, we'll dive in. Our episode topic for today is how do you train your staff to be experts? Where do you start in training to experts? My train to expert philosophy is has three different levels, but we're going to start with the beginning. You want your staff to be experts. Where do you start with that? 48 days to the work you love. If you're looking to start a side business or you need to reignite your passion, 48 days is the place to do it. I am personally a part of the 48 days community and I've seen enormous growth in understanding myself, my future, and my contribution to the world. I'm fired up anytime I'm talking to people in the 48 days community. Here's their tagline. We believe that every person has unique talents and abilities that when meshed with your values, dreams, and passions, can allow you to have a purpose, make a profit, and love your life. Click on the link in the show notes to join the waitlist for the 48 Days community so that you can jump in when new members are being accepted. It might just change your life. Our need to know for today is I'm a PE teacher. I'm in the gym. I've got health. How do I get started with project-based learning and how do elective courses work into project-based learning? The short answer is you need to talk to Jordan Manley. On Twitter, it's at Steam Wellness. If you go into episode 72, you can hear exactly what I mean. I interview Jordan on the podcast, and he gives you great insights into what PE and project-based learning look like together. He is definitely one of the experts in the space, and he's got some great ideas. Even just this idea, one that blew me away, is I remember in gym class, you always reported to your spot. Right, You go in the gym, you report to your spot, you get points for going to your spot, you get points for dressing, and he's just like, that's crazy. Why in the world would you do that? All you're doing is teaching compliance, and you're giving points for compliance. And I'm like, could you hear it? Like That was the the palm to face, because it's like, that's exactly what we're trying to conquer. We are trying to move kids from compliant to engaged, 
So what do you do? You, you don't have them just report to a specific spot for no particular reason or so that you can get attendance taken care of. You treat the learners like people, and you talk to them. You tell them why they need to be where they need to be. Tell them why it's good to dress, and if they don't, we'll figure something out. If you're not wearing the right shoes, we'll see if it's safe, and as long as it's safe, you can jump in. But when you start looking at equity and you start looking at leveling the playing field, what you really want, what, what are the things you really want kids to have when they leave PE? You want them to be healthy. You want them to understand why they need to be healthy and how do they create lifestyle choices where they can be healthy and have more opportunities for the future. Wouldn't that be more important than where I stand in, in line in PE? And I was a three-sport athlete. Like, PE was my thing, right? Like, I could crush it. But I didn't really learn how to be healthy long term. Right? Like I'm relearning all that right now as I'm trying to figure out how to be the most productive self that I can be and contribute to the world well. But I didn't learn it in PE class. And Jordan just flipped that, flips it on his head so that they're looking at empathy. Like they go and create a game in PE. They have to create rules. They have to interview someone that's going to play the game so they can create an, an empathetic form of this game. So he walks right down the steps of project-based learning. It really does a lot of the same things that a language arts teacher would do or a science teacher would do. He just sees the importance and the why of it, and then he finds ways to make it work. And you can do those same things in these other elective classes. Now, you do need time to do it, of course. Uh, sometimes you can combine your work with other uh, content teachers, uh, and you can be the skills-based portion. If you'll go back to episode 116, I interviewed... Uh, a group of teachers that had worked together to create a really neat PBL unit about creating a playground in their school and in their district, and they brought in the art teacher. So she was in the specials class, and she was able to work with those learners. And, of course, she had other learners from around the school that might have been doing different projects, but she was able to work with these teachers. They did it remotely. They didn't have a shared prep, but they made it work because they knew that it was important. Right Then that art teacher knew that the skills she was giving these learners were going to apply to the real world, and they would be super engaged. And in fact, that's what happened. So as you look at electives, as you look at PE, I would say jump in. right? Jump in with both feet and figure it out. Right? You, don't, you don't have to do it by yourself. Right? You find somebody. You know, follow Jordan on Twitter. He's a great follow. He's got a lot of great resources around that too. Go visit some other elective teachers in PBL schools and see how they do it. Like the path is, has been walked. You know, there are some steps there, right? So you can start to figure those things out. And we've got resources to help you plan as well. But elective teachers, jump in. And for the Leadership Leap today, we've got Mindset by Carol Dweck. Again, you have heard of this book. You've heard of Growth Mindset. But have you actually read it? Right, And sometimes I like to go back and read these ones that you know, you've know you seen YouTube videos or you've seen summaries. Um, and in this case, for the Leadership Leap, I'm going to dive into it. Maybe you don't need to. Um, so in this book, you'll learn how a simple belief about yourself, a belief we discovered in our research, guides a large part of your life. In fact, it permeates every part of your life. Much of what may be preventing you from fulfilling your potential grows out of it. No book has ever explained this mindset and shown people how to make use of it in their lives. You'll suddenly understand the greats in the science and the arts, in sports and business, and the would-have-beens. You'll understand your mate, your boss, your friends, your kids. You'll see how to unleash your potential and your children's potential. That's from Carol Dweck. And you, so if you're not familiar, it's growth mindset versus fixed mindset. And she does have some great stories where she walks through this. Uh, the difference of fixed mindset your self-worth is on the line with everything you do, uh, whether you fail or you're successful. And it's the kid that says, you know, I'm not good at math. And then, oddly enough, they're not good at math. right? But the kid that says, I'm not good at math yet, that's a growth mindset. That yet word is a big growth mindset word. So even if you start using that word yet, suddenly you're in the growth mindset camp. right? And really, as soon as you tag that on the end of some of your sentences or you help your learners add that to their sentences, you, you really do join the growth mindset camp, and you start to see things a little bit differently. The way I, the example that I got from the book that I think is more of a personal example for me is you know playing the piano. I don't play the piano, but I did learn how to play Amazing Grace. Now, when I go to play it, would you expect me to be really great at the piano? 
Like better than someone that's been working at the piano for a decade. Well, of course not. Like I just started. So a fixed mindset would be like, well, I'm not going to go play Amazing Grace because I'm not good at it and I'll look silly. But a growth mindset says, wow, look what I've done. Like I just started six months ago and I can already play Amazing Grace. Isn't that awesome? Now, I'm going to get better the more I practice. And that's the conversation you want to have with yourself. And there's a huge difference between the two. Because fixed mindset, you're, you're going to miss out on opportunities. So let me jump back in to the book and, and some of the work here. It's all research-based, which is why I think the whole world's loved it in the education space. Um, here's some, some more quotes. Believing that your qualities are carved in stone, the fixed mindset creates an urgency to prove yourself over and over again. Eek! Like, that's, that's a tough road to go. Like, if some of you are burning out, you might have a fixed mindset. Now, you can be a high flyer and still have a fixed mindset. Maybe you've just overcome some of those things, or you continue to prove yourself and prove yourself and prove yourself, and you're doing it, right? Like, you're, you're winning, in quotes. But eventually, that does lead to burnout, right? You've got to get that growth mindset to get to the top, 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 and for it to be sustainable. So that urgency to prove yourself over and over again that's a fixed mindset trait. And if you can move that to growth mindset, it allows you the, the margin for error. Right? You see errors, you see mistakes as opportunities to learn. Like Nelson Mandela said, I either win or I learn. So he doesn't lose. Right? He never had the opportunity to lose. It's like I win or I learn. Those were the two options for him. Let's see, in a, in a growth mindset... The hand you're dealt is just a starting point for development. The growth mindset is based on the belief that your basic qualities are things you can cultivate through your efforts. Although people may differ in every which way, in their initial talents, aptitudes, interests, or temperaments, everyone can change and grow through application and experience. That's the growth mindset. I will continually love the growth mindset. Like That's why we read books on leadership, because you can become a better leader. There are, there are not natural born leaders. There may be some that have tep- temperaments that lead towards that. Right? You may have some talents, but you can grow these things. Right? You can grow discipline. You can grow leadership that all leads towards a really exciting life and leads towards your school growing and you achieving your goals. You have a choice. Mindsets are just beliefs. They're powerful beliefs, but they're just something in your mind, and you can change your mind. That's Carol Dweckakun, directly from the book. Can I give you another example? So I used to run a lot in high school. I ran a lot, a lot. And uh, I trained with a guy named Chris, and we would do our trainings in the, you know, the back of the high school. We'd run a lot of miles. And when coach wasn't looking, Chris would cut the corners. All right, and, and he might beat me. But then we got to meets, right? Like we actually tra- you actually have medals and ribbons, right? And we're actually keeping tra- track and time of these things. And I would beat Chris often, pretty much every time. And it was a really interesting thing, and I really could never quite figure it out. Like I couldn't figure out like how you don't connect those dots, right? Like cutting corners in practice, and then it doesn't relate to the actual meet. Right. So, but I think it was a fixed mindset, right? His fixed mindset said, man, I've got an opportunity to beat Ryan. And he did. Like, he beat me in practice. I had no problem with that because I knew in meets it would be different. Right. My growth mindset was just, it was all about time. That was probably one of the biggest gifts that I was ever given was being a runner because you were always against the clock. You're always trying to get better. Right. You were never like at the top. So, there's always this growth mindset that I think comes with running. So, I've always loved the sport and it just makes a lot of sense to me. Malcolm Gladwell, the author and New York writer, has suggested that as a society we value natural effortless accomplishment over achievement through effort. We endow our heroes with superhuman abilities that lead them inevitably towards greatness. It's as if Midori popped out of the womb fiddling, Michael Jordan dribbling, and Picasso doodling. This captures the fixed mindset perfectly, and it's everywhere. We look at Michael Jordan and say, wow, he's so talented. I wish I had that talent and then I could be a great basketball player. Because you haven't seen the hours and hours of toil and practice that goes behind becoming an NBA superstar. And Dweck has a whole chapter on sports, the mindset of a champion, and she profiles several great athletes that were not naturals. 
Um, she lists Muhammad Ali, Babe Ruth, Michael Jordan, Mia Hamm, Jackie Joyner Kersey. And then she points out that the athletes worked extremely hard to get what they got. People with growth mindset know that it takes time for potential to flower. It gives you that margin to say, I'm here, but I'm going to be there. And it's going to take me time to get there. Success is sequential, not simultaneous. Many growth-minded people didn't even plan to get to the top. They got there as a result of doing what they love. It's ironic. The top is where the fixed mindset people hunger to be, but it's where many growth-minded people arrive as a byproduct of their enthusiasm for what they do. So just go out there and be passionate about your work. right? Be growth mindset. Know that you're going to continually get better, but just love, love, love your work. Those with a growth mindset found setbacks motivating. They're informative. They're a wake-up call. A good failure is good for you, right? Just get yourself a failure. If you're not failing, push harder. Try something bigger. Try again. Then when you fail, now you're going to start learning. I love it. Uh, Michael Jordan embraced his failures. In fact, in one of his favorite ads for Nike, he says, I've missed more than 9,000 shots. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. You can be sure that each time he went back and practiced that shot a hundred times. And you can go find that YouTube video where he talks about that. If you put in YouTube, Jordan, Nike, and failure. It's so good. Kids need to hear it. Adults need to hear it. Our teachers are perfectionists, aren't they? Raise your hand. Yes, they are. They want to be perfect. And they want to do the right thing by kids, which is great. But the right thing is to show some failure, is to grow and build from there. So... I think you can go ahead and pick up the book. Um, If you like the research, if you want more stories, then you should pick up the book. If you need to differentiate between fixed mindset and growth mindset, you can probably do that by adding the word yet in there. That might be too simplistic, but that might be just what you're looking for too, right? So I know you've heard of growth mindset at this point if you've been in education. So what you want to do is I I guess maybe I can't express enough to you how important the growth mindset is for you as a leader, for you to demonstrate for your staff so that your staff can demonstrate it for your learners. That growth mindset is so important for building momentum and grassroots work because if everybody's on pins and needles trying to get it perfect, you'll never get the work done. You have to have permission to fail. You have to have permission to say, I failed, now let's fix it and get better. That's where the growth mindset is going to pay huge dividends. On to our main episode topic. We're in this series of walking out your path and your your journey. We talked about at the beginning, we've got to define the problems. We define the dissonance. What's not quite right with education in my context? Define the ideal. And then we define the path, and now we're going to dive into each portion of that path. So the first step in the path is to train to expert. You can't have teachers that are novices in a particular discipline and expect to get the results that you want. So how do you train your teachers to expert? It's going to take a while, right? Just like we talked about in Growth Mindset, it's not a a simultaneous process. It's going to be sequential. It's going to take time. So where do you start as you train to expert? Let's start there. Every teacher wants to be an expert in their chosen field, but we all start out somewhere. And the tricky thing for you as a leader is that whether you're, if you've got a staff of 30, they're all in different spots. They've all had different experiences. So as a leader, you need to choose a PD experience that builds culture as well as skill sets. A PD experience that builds culture as well as skill sets. Then you can build both of these by looking for these three components to professional development. Because where do you start? You've got to start with PD. You've got to start growing your staff, and you're going to grow your staff in culture and skills. So the first key component to good professional development is culture building. So is the professional development sit and get? How will the information be presented? How will the information be digested? These are questions that you're going to have to ask. It's hard when you uh, are looking at a PD organization. Like, how do you really know? Because, uh, you know, as somebody that 
does professional development all around the country, like I'm going to give you good testimonials, right? I'll send you where it worked really well, right? So you've got to start looking for shared wording. That's where I think you find it is where do you share values? And a lot of times our values are shown in the words that we use. So for us at Magnify Learning, like when we do a PBL jumpstart, we talk about the culture building aspect as one of the main transformational pieces that you get out of a three-day workshop. Is Are you going to learn project-based learning? Absolutely. Are you going to come out with a PBL unit? Yes. Are you going to have a bunch of resources to follow that up with? Of course. But everybody's got resources. There's a ton of resources out there. We give most of those away for free. The real secret sauce for us is that you get to be with two PBL certified facilitators that have done the work, that are doing the work. You get to collaborate with your team. You get to build a PBL unit while you're in the training. Those are the things, the culture building pieces that we try to portray to potential partners because we want you to know that we're going to help you build culture, not just skill sets. If it was just skill sets, you should just get everybody my book. You can read it and then go do it. But if you really want to train to experts, you've got to get some professional development, and that has to focus on culture just as much as skill sets. So what's the second key component to professional development? The second key component is, is the professional development immediately applicable to your teachers? When are they going to apply this? Are they going to go to the conference, get some neat materials, come back and put it in their conference files, and then never see it again and get to it when they have time? Right, which we know doesn't exist, right? That's in quotes somehow. There's never really time to apply those things. So when is it applicable? When will your teachers actually be creating things? Will they have to learn a process and the skill sets now and then apply them later? Because again, later doesn't exist. Because later often never happens. So again, just looking at our process then how you look at other organizations is that your teachers are immediately creating a PBL unit for their content area and for their grade level. So if they're making it in June and school starts up in August, they can start that PBL unit right there in August. Like they're creating it during those three days. When you learn about entry events, you build an entry event. And that's something you, you've got to have is when is this going to be applicable? Because if you wait six months and then try to apply something, you've likely forgotten most of the context, right? So it's hard to recreate those things. So you want to be creating during a PD session. So if somebody says, you know, we'd love for them to create some of this, but there's really just too much information to get through during our time, they'll have to create it later. Like that's a big red flag for me. Like that is not going to bring you to expert because you're most of your staff, if you look at your innovation curve, your innovators will probably figure out a way to do it. But the majority of your staff is not going to be ready to take a brand new concept, learn it on their own, apply it on their own, and then implement. So they've got to start creating right away. That's the second key component. The third key component to great professional development that builds culture and skill sets is having room for continuous improvement. Nobody's an expert after one training. It just doesn't happen, right? You've got to have more than one training. And more importantly, what we've found is you have to have coaching. We actually don't have any offerings anymore that you can get without coaching because it just doesn't turn out as well, right? If you want to do three days in June, we're going to do coaching with you throughout the next year so that we can be there as a support for your staff so that when they have questions, we can answer those so that while they're implementing, they've got someone there to say, hey, try this, tweak that, let's reflect. And one of the, one of the pieces that sometimes we miss, I think, in the leadership side is that your teachers just want to know that it's important to you, that it's not a one-time investment, right? They want to know that they're going to have support throughout, that you're going to continue this. One of my favorite stories is my mentor, my first couple years of teaching, project-based learning came along. And I was like, man, Bruce, this looks really great. I think we should do this. He's like, yeah, I think I'm going to wait this one out. I like, well, what do you mean wait it out? It's like, well, if you give it three years or so, they'll move on to something different and you can just keep doing whatever you're doing. It's like, oh, it turns out that's completely true, right? Like I, I obviously stuck with project-based learning because it changes lives. But Bruce saw that it probably wasn't going to have the buy-in long-term. So you've got to let your staff know that there are areas for continuous improvement. One, just because that's how learning works, right? Like we'd never teach something in three days and then never talk about it again for the next year, right? You continually come back to it. 
So there has to be coaching built in whatever professional development you're going to bring. And that is how you start to bring your staff to an expert level. So what you're going to do is you've got three components to professional development, and they need to fulfill both culture building and the skill sets because they have to fit into your, your current work. So number one, the first key component is, is there culture building built in? Number two, is the work immediately applicable to your teachers? And number three, is there room for continuous improvement, some kind of coaching that's built in so that while we're implementing, these things are uh, being supported by someone from that organization? So if that is how you can start to train your folks to expert. That is the very first step. We're going to have two more steps in this training to expert uh, portion of our path. We're going to talk about how do you get advanced and then how do you get to where you can train others. That's what starts to fulfill your train to expert is you have your own experts on your staff that can train new hires, that can keep the momentum and the culture going. So if this is something you're super interested in and you want to fast track this, you say, that's neat, Ryan, but I don't want to listen to the rest of these podcast episodes. I want to jump in. We've got design days where you can jump in and do that. We'll come right to you or you can come to one of our model schools or this summer, sometime in June, at the end of June, we're going to have a a two-day conference where you can bring your leadership team and we will walk you through creating a three-year plan that includes all of these path points here. And as you do this, as you figure out your three-year plan and then you start to walk these things out, you're going to find that you will, in fact, engage your learners, you'll tackle boredom, and you'll transform your classrooms. Let's go Lead Inspired. Thank you for listening to this episode of the PBL Simplified Podcast. Would you help us achieve our vision of 51 by 2051? One small step you can take to help us out is to leave a review of the PBL Simplified podcast. Scroll down to the bottom of our show page, select a star rating, and leave a review. Your review helps others find this podcast. When you leave a review, the next visionary leader will see your words and join us. Thank you for leading inspired.